Good evening, people. Um, thanks for coming to my channel. So this is probably going to be a longer one, so feel free to multitask. I should probably put that as a disclaimer on all my videos, actually. Um, I, I don't make five-minute videos because I think that the subject matter that I discuss it can't really be done in a snapshot format. Um, and there are a number of things I want to say. Um, I can't remember a news story. Um, in my lifetime over a relatively short period of time that has got this much coverage in in our domestic UK press and media. And uh, I think that's totally understandable. I think it's um, appropriate. Uh, of course, there's been many big events um, in my lifetime. 9-11 um, was huge, obviously. Uh, coronavirus, the pandemic was, was probably the single biggest event. Uh, but of course that was over, um, long period of time. I think it's finally starting to wind down now. That's that was huge. The invasion of Ukraine. Um the Arab Spring, the the fall of communism or Soviet communism rather in nineteen eighty nine. Um just some of the many big events. Um but in terms of domestic coverage, I think this is unparalleled. Um just as an indication, some of you may know I collect newspapers. Well pretty much got everything over the last 10 days uh here we go this is um that pile is just over a week of coverage i basically got every national newspaper on the day that the queen died and um by my standards even that's a lot i mean if you look in the background that's two years of news right this is a week some people might say that's success. For me, it's about history. It's about preserving history. And the thing about a newspaper, um, and this is why they're selling on eBay, I'm selling myself um, newspapers. The, the reason a raw newspaper is different from just seeing an online archive, it's, uh, well, I don't know what the reason is, but it does feel different. I'll give you, uh, I want to show you something interesting. I discovered this in my um, cellar not long ago. I made my parents don't quite know where this came from. We thought maybe my late grandparents um, it might have come from their house. They ran a bed and breakfast in Belfast, um, but my dad doesn't think that's the case. Anyway, it's a copy of the Belfast Telegraph, which is one of the um, oldest and most respected regional publications in the UK, and it's actually covering the death of the king. I'll just be careful how I handle this. 70 years old. Just want to hold that for a few seconds. Death of the king stuns the nation. Princess Elizabeth becomes first reigning queen in 51 years. It's a copy of the Belfast Telegraph, Wednesday, February the 6th, 1952. Two pence. Prince Charles becomes the Duke of Cornwall. He was three years old at the time. Um, but extensive coverage on that. Now, 70 years later, it's his daughter and the world's longest reigning queen. Um, that mantle incidentally goes to uh, Queen Marguerite II of Denmark, who herself is celebrating her golden jubilee this year. Uh, she's now the only reigning queen in the world. There are, of course, queen consorts, but all the other monarchs are, are male kings and emperors. Um, coverage has been extensive, but I want to just... Uh, I want to talk about tomorrow's events and a little bit about the future of the monarchy. Um, so before before I get into tomorrow, I'm, I just want to quote something from the Times. This is the Times, the day she died, or the day after, I should say. Uh, that, that's a famous portrait. It's a coronation portrait. It's almost circulated. Uh, and I, I think one of the best. It's very elegant, very regal, obviously. Um, some magazines have been going with the young queen, some with the older queen. Um, shows the span. I mean, I might have mentioned this before, but her first Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, born in 1874. Her last Prime Minister, Liz Truss, born in 1975. So just over a century spanning her two Prime Ministers' births. That's astonishing. Or the fact that Eisenhower was President when she ascended the throne. Um, 
Jared Baker, in his piece in the Times, uh, says Elizabeth was the only constant on the world stage for seventy years. The only constant, um, and that's that's quite something. I mean, think of all the influential leaders has been in the late twentieth century, early twenty first century. Um, some of them political giants, but she was the only one. Who was that constant? I suppose you could say King Bomapom of Thailand. He was the third longest reigning monarch in history. He was king for also 70 years. Um, but I don't think he had the same presence around the world. Deeply respected in Thailand. But um, I'm not sure if he had the same global presence that the Queen did. With all due respect. Um, let me just uh, quote some things from the time here, which is notable. Let's see. Where does the monarchy go after its second Elizabethan age? Talking of Elizabethan, I was watching Elizabeth the Golden Age last night, of course, about Queen Elizabeth I, who's widely seen as one of our greatest, if not our greatest, monarch. Elizabeth I was the greatest monarch, then Elizabeth II was absolutely our greatest constitutional monarch. You know, Victoria, um, Victoria lent her name to an age and she was monarch at the zenith of our power when Britain really was a superpower that continued into the reign of George V. Um, but Victoria was quite a distant figure. She was the widow of Windsor for years. Um, I think Elizabeth II will go down in history as almost an almost perfect constitutional monarch. This is not to say that she never made mistakes. She was slow to act um, on Aberfan. On Diana's death, um, but seventy years. I mean, you can't expect someone to be superhuman. Will be some slip ups. Um, I think, given that she came to the throne at twenty five, given the issues she faced, I mean, she was balancing motherhood with her role as head of state. She had to preside over people underestimated this. Actually, she had to preside over the decline of empire. I mean, her father was the last king emperor. Um, things could have went really south with a different monarch in the sense that had there been a really inept, unprepared um, young sovereign who was maybe arrogant or out of touch or whatever, um, this country really could have declined. Now, we lost her superpower status, but I would argue that thanks to her, largely thanks to her, the United Kingdom has maintained its respect around the world for a large part. Sure, there's pockets who oppose this country. Um, but I really do believe that she was a genuinely respected figure. And the fact that world leaders, are, well, I'll come to that in a minute, but the fact that world leaders are descending on London uh, today, tonight, it's a testament. To that. Anyway, um, where does the monarchy go after its second Elizabethan age? Uh, let me just read some segments out from this. Um, let's see. Um, there was some... Uh, here we go. If the Elizabethan age just uh, ended is anything to go by, and it is, then the monarchy of the future will be smaller, older, cannier, funnier, more reticent and micromanaged, underdressed in private moments and lavish in public ceremony, more informal and not more intimate. Royalty of the 21st century will appear more middle class while being nothing of the sort. It will be run on business lines under Elizabeth, monarchy just about broke even. Henceforth, it will have to show stakeholders a clear cultural profit. Quite clinical business-like terms there. But this is true. Monarchy, you know, people, Republicans say monarchy is outdated, it's archaic. But they fail to recognise that, particularly the Queen, but... I, I think senior royals uh, now the new king for sure. They're they're more in touch than people think, than Republicans think, in the sense that they know the queen certainly knew this. It could not remain stagnant. Now it's true that there were outside uh, people who helped to influence that. Uh, I'm pleased that an episode of the Prime was dedicated to the efforts of Lord Grey who is a, a Tory peer and um, a newspaper proprietor, or a um, newspaper editor, I should say. And his efforts to modernise the monarchy was 
initially got quite a bit of backlash from traditionalists, but um, and he was even physically assaulted. But he uh, he really history owes him and people like that. But and I think Tony Blair deserves some credit. You know, uh, the right wing press wouldn't admit this, but Blair did uh, as the quiet, as the Queen's advisor, he did really I think um, make it clear that needed to get more in public touch in that week. Uh, is it a stretch to say Tony Blair saved the monarchy? Maybe, maybe. But I think he'd done his constitutional role as Prime Minister very well in that week. You know, he um, he made it clear what the situation was without being badgering and disrespectful. Um, Stanley Baldwin had to do that during the abdication, so her Prime Ministers have also been very important. But 15 of them. 15 of them. I mean, uh, the way that was described is, is interesting because... Both the King and my heir apparent, Prince William, uh, the Prince of Wales, I think they are very in touch. I mean, the way they're going around shaking hands, the Queen didn't do that. Um, the, the interesting thing about Elizabeth II was she was something of a distant figure in the sense that she was sort of revered and majestic, and uh, and yet there was a bit of a distance. There was a bit of a, fear is the wrong word, but there was a, a majesty, a sort of distance between her and the people. She didn't go around shaking hands in that sense. Um, Charles is a lot more in touch in that sense. And yet we can't say that the Queen was cold. I don't think we could say that, because if she was, a mom who would have crumbled years ago. And actually, almost everyone who met her on a personal basis said she was actually quite warm, and she was engaged, and she was genuinely interested. I mean, she must have heard thousands and thousands of stories it must have bored her at times yeah i'm sure that there must have been times when she thought um this is you know this is very tedious but she never let it show and she always gave the impression that um she was genuinely interested this is what people have said that met her um that's remarkable i mean her people skills in that sense were incredible she may not have had that um what Diana had, but I think whatever way we look at it, if she had been a, a monarch, if she didn't have something, the monarchy would have collapsed years ago. And it didn't. It prevailed. Uh, so that brings me to another very important part of a reign that's sometimes misunderstood, which is the Commonwealth. Uh, let me just get to, let's see, where are we? 34. Let's see if these pages, because I wanted to mention them, mention these segments. Page 34. Incidentally, while I'm looking for this, Liz Truss. Uh, obviously, understandably, there hasn't been that much focus on her over the past week, but she has really had a bit of a baptism of fire in the sense that a day and a half on the job as Prime Minister, and this news happens, and basically she's leading the nation in mourning. Uh, of course, the King is, and his siblings are, but politically she is leading the nation in mourning. Um, this is a massive undertaking, and I, I suspect tomorrow's events will be a combined effort from the Metropolitan Police, probably the uh, London government, um, Home Office, uh, the Royal Household. I imagine it's a combined effort, but certainly Liz Truss will be a very busy woman today. Um, she's been hosting world leaders. Uh, let me just uh, quote something here from... Uh, let me see. There was a piece on the Commonwealth which I do want to mention. Just bear with me. There was a segment too in the Times about why Charles just went with Charles, and they pretty much confirmed uh, that that is why he's reigning as Charles III. They pretty much confirmed what I thought. The public has known him for 70 years. I mean, that's another thing. He's also a record breaker, the longest serving heir apparent in history. Um, 70 years um, he's been known as Charles so it wouldn't make any sense to go as George VII in the case of the Queen's father he was thrust into the role um, and he, he, he was known as Bertie of course uh, Edward VIII was known as David um, but I think it makes sense that he's went with Charles III I also think it's a certain I mean, there was supposed to be some sort of uh, superstition or 
unease about the name Charles. The first Charles, of course, lost his head. The second Charles was a womanizer and um, somewhat controversial monarch, although I would say quite popular because the Merry Monarch, the Restoration and all of that. But it sort of bring harks back to the Stuarts. I mean, it's called sort of a... This is the unique thing about British monarchy. I mean, we're seeing these events, we're seeing the lying in state. It's, it's almost medieval looking, in a good way. I mean, it's just preservation of history that you just don't get in the same way in republics. It, it's, um, it's something special. You know, all the pageantry, the, the various units of the of the i'm probably using the wrong terms here but uh, the yeoman of the guard the, the cold stream guards uh, the household guard all, all these specific pageantry that is around this it's um all the traditions this is something that's been done for a millennium literally there will be some changes over that time in the precise nature of it but pretty much what we're looking at is a continuation of a millennium of history. In fact, even older, if we, we sometimes make the mistake of judging the beginning of English kings and queens from William the Conqueror. No, it goes back to Ethelstan, who was really the first king uh, in the House of Wessex of the United England, and Alfred laid the foundations of that. But it's it's something special. Um, let's see. I mean, there's a, there's a scene in the crime where Queen Mary of Tech is talking about how Philip, um, the Queen, sort of says, in an egalitarian age, Philip doesn't believe it's right. That, anyway, it's an interesting scene, but he's talking about how Philip wanted to change things. And Mary of Tech says, uh, perhaps unfairly, what would he know of? Uh, Edward the Confessor, Alfred the Great, William the Conqueror, Henry VIII, the Sword of Destiny. Uh, I mean, you just don't get these things in a republic. It, and I think Republicans sometimes underestimate the cultural side of it. I mean, their argument is it's hard to argue against. It's in the sense that we have this hereditary head of state or, you know, unelected, right? So it's undemocratic. But I suppose you could argue it is democratic in the sense that most of the people support it. Now, if a majority, I don't want to end the whole Republican debate here, but if a majority of the British people were against the royal family, the royal family would go. There wouldn't be a civil war. There wouldn't be. It would be a major, major event, of course. But you know, when Republicans say it's undemocratic, they're ignoring the fact that the majority support it. Surely that's the very epitome of democracy. Um, now, a large part of that may be the Queen, but so far I think Charles has handled himself very well. I mean, there was a heckler uh, in Cardiff with um, Charles. You know, not not. Uh, your Majesty, he just went, Charles, we are uh, struggling to pay our energy bills and we're having to pay for your procession, your procession. Forget the fact that it's the uh, death of his mother. But anyway, um, Charles kind of just muttered something and moved on. I mean, what can he say in those situations? Um, he was blindsided. I suppose he could have said, oh, I understand. But then, then he would have got into a big debate with the man and could have just turned into something else. But Charles doesn't set the policies, and um, this is a unique event. And I think there's a debate around republicanism, but they, they're going to have their time. Ten days is all people are asking for. Um, I'm trying to find a segment on the Commonwealth because it was a good write-up. Let's see. Uh, I'm sure I've missed it. The Times, obviously, is very extensive. Earlier on, by the way, the BBC messed up a little bit. I noticed this. Um, the BBC woman, I'm not sure which presenter it was, but as the world leaders were coming in, it was clearly Queen Marguerite II of Denmark and her consort. And the BBC woman incorrectly said it was the King and Queen of the Netherlands. Well, the King of the Netherlands is quite a young man, Willem Alexander. Um, and then I think they messed up again. She said it's the Japanese Emperor Naruhito. Uh, she didn't name the Emperor, but he was going forward, and I recognised actually it was the Dragon King um, of Bhutan and his lovely young wife, uh, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful women in the world. Um, yeah, so I think they met, mixed them up as well, but anyway, uh, where is this? It's... There was, of course, other Royal Charles, who was a young pretender, Bonnie Prince Charlie. 
who styled himself as Charles III. But I think the last Jacobite pretender, his um, brother, Henry, died in 1807 and never tried to pursue the Jacobite claim. For my international viewers, the Jacobites were those who advocated for a continuation of the Stuart dynasty under um, under the Jameses, hence the name Jacobite from the Latin, which is why we're calling this new era the Caroline era. Um, but the Jacobite cause was crushed in four rebellions, 1689, 1715, 1718, and 1745. Um, let's see, I'm going to use both hands here. I really do want to find this. It was a good write-up, and I've literally just read it. Where is it? If I can't find this, I'll just talk about it tomorrow. I do think, while I'm looking for this, I do think Charles is going to be under enormous pressure. I heard what I think was in the Atlantic proposed that he should abdicate at 75 the way that judges do in this country. Um, I don't think so. I understand the, rec the, the understanding of it, which is that William's still quite a young man. He's only 40. He'd be, uh, Charles is 73, so William would only be 42 then. But it's kind of a nostalgic thing, you know, People have this fairy tale idea of the young Queen Elizabeth II. Well, well, maybe never see that again, um, unless some awful tragedy were to happen and George or Charlotte were to ascend the throne. But I don't think even that would happen because, as a protocol, members of the royal family don't travel together precisely for that reason. So you won't have the King and the Prince of Wales travelling together on a flight. I see as a precaution. Um, so I don't think that'll happen. An abdication would also bring back bad memories of what happened with Edward VIII, which basically catapulted George VI onto the throne and led to the Queen being the Queen. Um, okay, I found this piece on the Commonwealth. Um, this is the article. Excuse me. Uh, we could see there her state visit to, I believe that's Sri Lanka. Excuse me, the Queen riding an elephant in India in 1961. Um, okay, so I just want to read out a little segment on this. Um, Commonwealth she inherited from her father, George VI, was a very different organisation from the one we see today. When she came to the throne, there were eight members of which India was the only one not to have the Queen as head of state. Despite its origins in the dying embers of the British Empire, it was originally called the British Commonwealth. Over the decades, it has expanded well beyond that select club of eight. Of the 56 present members, only 15, including the UK, had the Queen as, he as head of state. Of those, Jamaica has announced plans to become a republic. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot more of interesting things in that article, but I think people get mixed up with the Commonwealth realm and those countries that have the Queen of as head of state. So most countries in the Commonwealth... Um, well, actually, the Commonwealth realm would be just those 15, yeah. But the Commonwealth, most of them don't have the Queen or the King as head of state. Charles, of course, is now ascended to be King of Australia, King of Canada, King of New Zealand. This is going to be one of the biggest challenges that he faces, and he's going to need to be very, very careful on it. Uh, I just saw an interview about an hour ago with uh, Anthony Albany, the Australian Prime Minister, and he's been very diplomatic, I have to say, although he comes from a Republican background. Um, he said that uh, the issue of rep Republicanism isn't going to be addressed in his first term. Um, and that he was really the praising the Queen's diplomacy, everyone has. Um, but this is going to be a major challenge for Charles and William because there are growing demands for reparations and so on. I I got a bit frustrated in my video the other night because I think that this is, as Douglas Murray pointed out, you know, when we freed the slaves in 1833 across the empire, actually I think it was the initial um, abolition act of 1807 when they were freed in the, what, or when it was abolished in the United Kingdom, the treasury spent 40% of its budget that year in this act. 40%. That's massive. Massive. So that shows how seriously it was taken. Um, I would argue that that, combined with decades and decades of foreign aid to help 
development is reparations. I am critical of the idea of reparations because I don't know where you draw the line. I certainly think that it's right that we express um, remorse some um, of the things that happened under the empire. Full apologies. Um, that's a difficult one. I mean, you could argue Japanese prime ministers have apologised for imperial war crimes and they've been full apologies. Um, Germany certainly apologised for its role in the Holocaust. Um, I think it's, it's misguided to compare the British Empire to those regimes because for one thing, it lasted a lot longer than either Imperial Japan or um, Third Reich in Germany, but it was a lot more complex. There were some evil things done under the British rule. I'm a British citizen, I'm freely admitting that. But as Douglas Murray pointed out, people act as if Queen Elizabeth II was personally responsible for everything that happened. Perhaps one of the most difficult things early in her reign was the uh, Maumau uprising in Kenya. And it is probably true that British forces done some pretty bad things. Let's just say it, probably true. But by the same token, the Maumau were not innocent either. They killed and tortured Kenyan civilians. If the British forces did, they did as well. Now, this is not to say let's keep a tally, but... You know, they tortured fellow Kenyans, they murdered fellow Kenyans, civilians. They weren't innocent. Um, they killed people in their beds. Uh, so, historic context is very, very important. And one of my biggest problems with the left, who want to decolonize the curriculum, and this is all relevant to, by the way, all of these events, because they will keep pushing it and keep pushing it. They have selective outrage. I saw a link earlier that someone had made in one of the forums that I'm on about the Kingdom of Dahomey. Apparently this new king, uh, film coming out, the, the uh, I think it's called The Woman King, and it's about um, a woman who ascended the throne of the Kingdom of Dahomey in West Africa. And that kingdom kept slaves, African slaves. This was an African kingdom. One of the ways it held its power was through slave labour. So those who want to decolonise curriculums and constantly lambast the British, um, I wish they'd be a bit more honest about slavery because they talk as if the transatlantic slave trade was the only one. They talk about uh, the British should apologise for this, but what about African complicity? And I don't see why it should be controversial to question that because it's never mentioned. What about the Barbary slave trade in which white Europeans were captured by Barbary pirates in North Africa? Um, I suppose they would argue, well, generational poverty and hardship is a direct result of colonisation in the West Indies. But how then do you explain how other former colonies have become relatively prosperous? That if, if you could simply say, well, colonisation caused poverty, I mean, Zambia, for example, the gulf between Zambia and the United Kingdom is greater now than when it was a colony. This was pointed out by Neil Ferguson in his, his excellent book, Empire. I just think that it's not as black and white as people make it out to be. And that awful academic who uh, said that she hoped the Queen died in excruciating death, those sort of vitriolic voices, um, they're not going to go away, unfortunately. And they're poisoning young minds. I'm not saying that um, people need to blindly adulate the Queen, but this is an event that's unparalleled, certainly in this country's history. And I do think tomorrow's going to be profoundly moving. I've seen people who are Republicans, even, um, maybe not line up to the coffin. I've seen even Republicans saying they were moved by this. I've seen people say, by the way, one of those protests, as I mentioned recently about the hyperbole around this, one of the protesters said, oh, we're just like Putin's Russia. Well, I hope it was pointed out to him that in Putin's Russia, you know, you're dragged away and sent to prison immediately. These people were holding the placards and nothing was happening. So it's not at all like Putin's Russia. Uh, I'm pleased, by the way, that Putin's been humiliated again not only by his losses in Ukraine, but um, by being snubbed tomorrow along with some other rogue regimes. 
uh, somewhat controversial that China's vice premier will be here. Um, but at least Russia's being snubbed. I think that's a good thing. I think it's good that they're humiliated and polarized in the world stage. Um, this isn't just Western countries. Representatives from across the world will be in London tomorrow. So I think it's good that Putin is polarized and embarrassed. It's all that tyrant deserves. The arrogance, the arrogance of the Kremlin to say that it's a blasphemy to not be invited. Um, in 1994, the Queen visited Russia when Yeltsin was president, and she must have had memories of what happened to the Romanovs, but being the great diplomat she was, um, she went there. Now, these reports that have emerged from Ukraine in the past few days of mass graves, signs of torture. This barbaric regime in the Kremlin needs to be shunned at every possibility. I, I think they're evil. And um, Margarita Simonian of RT, all she could out was um it's it, it would be almost amusing if it wasn't for the horrible things happening in ukraine but all she could muster was um oh it's just another death um people aren't obliged to grieve or something like that well it's true people aren't obliged to grieve but these russian nationalists know that they're polarized and i think they're lashing out i so hope that war ends soon because it's going to take decades decades to rebuild in terms of material damage for sure um but also the the bitterness understandable bitterness and pain that the ukrainian people have been put through also um russian soldiers you know their families are grieving i mean what this man putin has been has done is just disgusting and i i feel so my stomach turns when I see people defending him. I've noticed a lot of, uh, I don't know why it is, but on social media, a lot of people from African countries praise Putin. I wonder, can they even find Ukraine on a map? I mean, I don't think they really understand why they're praising Putin, except that they're anti-West. Um, it's sickening. The tentacles of Russian lies spread far and wide. Um, but I honestly don't think relations will be normalized until Putin dies. And when he dies, what's it going to be? It'll be a huge story. But will he get the sort of adulation that our Queen's getting? No. Absolutely not. I think there'll be probably some people at his state funeral. Chinese representatives, Burmese, possibly India. But I do think it will be widely snubbed, even if they're invited. I don't think Western countries will go to his state funeral. And why should they? He's an utter tyrant. I mean, the contrast between Putin and Elizabeth II is, is worlds apart. So how anyone could say that she was a tyrant queen, it, it just utterly ignores context, it ignores history. Um, she has carried herself profoundly well, and I think Charles has as well. I mean, that ceremony, I'm going to round this up to the ceremony in Barbados last year, it must have been uncomfortable for Charles. He knew what it was. And he knows that they have a sovereign right to choose their own destiny. This is the thing. If the British are really as arrogant and imperialistic as some people think, wouldn't we just be dictating to uh, Commonwealth countries? But we're not. This is not happening. Both Charles and William have clearly said that it's up to these countries to decide their own destiny. They're not dictating and saying you must bow to us. I know that uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales... Commonwealth tour, excuse me, their Caribbean tour was, some of that was badly managed, it has to be said. Why there has to be super sensitivity. I don't think it was so much them, I think it was some of the organisers. I mean, the photograph, for example, of Catherine shaking hands with children, apparently through a fence, things like that. It's bad optics, unfortunately. Um, so that probably could have been planned better. But really, um, this is a very fine balancing act because what we're seeing is, I mean, Gabon joined the Commonwealth, even though that was never a British colony, it was a French colony. Now, that might have just been a political rebuke to Paris, but the Commonwealth is very far from dead. And I think the very fact that it still exists is a testament to this woman. Um, true, only 15 of those countries had, I say only 15, but 15 countries had her as head of state. No other figure in world history has been head of state of so many countries at once. 
And you might say it's a legacy of the British Empire, but this was by choice. These countries weren't forced to maintain the Queen as head of state. It was by choice. And even the others that decided that they were going to be republics, they still chose to send the Commonwealth of Nations, which, whatever way we gloss over, has its origins in the British Empire. So I think all of this is a testament to, A, the fact that empire wasn't black and white, but B, that those countries see a mutual interest in staying in. Uh, yes, they want to choose their own destiny, their proud countries. That's, that's their right. But when people say that Elizabeth II was this colonialist figurehead, um, they're so wrong. They're so wrong because she did not dictate anything. They chose that association. And I think they will continue to under Charles. I do think he's going to be challenged because he doesn't have the international influence that his mother had. Um, he's coming to the throne at 73. But he has, I do think he has a warm touch with people. I think Charles is a good communicator, actually. Um, and this is an enormous task that he has ahead of basically maintaining the Commonwealth as well as... I, I don't think there's going to be a sudden Republican surge in the UK. I really don't think that because I think already we're starting to see people have quite a bit of respect for King Charles III. I think they're starting to see some of the best aspects of his mother in him. And I don't think they're seeing it as, oh, well, it's a Prince of Wales who had a questionable um, relationship record and he sometimes was outspoken. And I think they're now saying this is King Charles III. And so far, he's handled himself remarkably well, I, I believe. Um, of course, it's early days. There could be some big scandal in the future or God forbid. But I'm a royalist and I, uh, I'm i cautiously optimistic. I think the monarchy's in good hands. That's my gut feeling. It will be a challenge. Charles and William are really going to have to try hard to be respectful, which I'm sure they will be. But um, they have to be respectful of Commonwealth nations, they have to listen to people. And if those countries choose to be republics, that's that's their destiny. But I do hope, I hope that even if they become republics, they will maintain strong links to the United Kingdom, sentimentally and politically. I really hope that happens. Um, we have a complex relationship with India today. It's sometimes good, sometimes not so good, uh, but I would say it's important. Um, Anyway, that's the future. Final few words, because this has been a long video. Tomorrow's security operation is going to be immense. It's going to be bigger than the London 2012 Olympics. It's going to be bigger than G20 summits. It's going to be huge. And I do not envy uh, police officers tomorrow, or especially not the new head of the Met. I mean, we have a new king, new prime minister, new head of the Metropolitan Police, Mark Rowley, I believe his name is. Um, they're going to be under enormous pressure. I just hope to God the likes of Extinction Rebellion or someone else doesn't try anything foolish. The other night, apparently, some guy tried to pull the royal standard off the coffin. He was immediately apprehended. They cut the knife feet. God knows why. Uh, if he was not mentally well, if he was... Apparently, they're really even looking out for claimants to the throne. But this doesn't happen often where you have the death of a monarch and an ascension of a new monarch. Um... Profound, profound events. I'll be saying a lot more on this subject. This has been a long video, but I feel it was important. I doubt anyone will have watched this to the end, but it's just there for the record. Okay, so even cinemas will be screening the events tomorrow. I'm sure there'll be a lot more to say, but I'll save it for another video. Thanks for watching.